Hello, welcome back. We appreciate your guys' consistent showing up to our classes. And today we're going to be talking about parenting with a heart at peace. This is Troy Faddis, licensed marriage and family therapist. Hi, this is Dr. Maddie Leaving, a psychologist and marriage and family therapist. We're happy to be here with you today. So um, when Legacy first started, I can't believe it's been eight years ago. We started uh, in the uh, summer of uh, 2011. We uh, we had all worked together for a long time, uh, most of us for uh, most of a, of a decade together. And we worked for a company that had been bought and sold a few times, and they had recently gone through the recession of 2010-11 and decided that the parent company wanted to close beds, so they did, and the ones that were in Loa, Utah were closed. And so the four of us decided to uh, start anew. And we turned out our pockets and made a, a program together, which became Legacy Outdoor Adventures and also Juniper Canyon. And when we decided what we wanted our program to look like, uh, we had already been using some of the material from the Arbinger Institute. And one of their main books was called, or is titled, The Heart of Peace. And the, the idea behind it is a, it's a philosophical approach of being able to see another person. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, we can get stuck or have a schema within ourselves of only seeing myself, seeing I or me. And the opposite of that is to see us or we. And when we truly have a perspective, an outward perspective of seeing other people beyond just ourselves, and this is somewhat developmental, you know, children see themselves first. As we grow up, we really learn how to see other people and sometimes seeing other people first. And that's the basis of the anatomy of peace. And so we decided that we wanted to make our core principle the, the having a heart of peace, being able to see others as equal and as important as our own desires, needs, and pains. So legacy has four things. We call it the legacy way of being. And the, at the center of it is having a heart at peace. And then the three other components are being an honorable person. So for men, being an honorable man. And for women's program, being an, honor, an honorable woman. And what does that look like and mean? And I found that when we first started, most of those who decided to come to us, among the other options they could have had, had a lot to do with the... Uh, the non-shaming heart at peace, and the emphasis on becoming the person that you can become or becoming that person when you are at your very best all of the time. The other two parts of, of it is a, is a recovery is a way of being. What does it mean to live a life of recovery all the time, not just go through a rest prevention plan? And third, I think most mental health change and uh, peace and uh, help comes from a basis of self-awareness, being able to be mindful, aware, and um, non-judgmentally own where we are in our thought and in our feelings. So those are the those are the basis for the way of being. Troy, can I jump in? Yeah. When we were having discussions about starting the women's program. Juniper Canyon, which was about three years ago when we first started talking about it, um, is that we realized as we were going through that, that legacy way of being, that there was one essential part that wasn't in the original model, but was really a core piece of what we do, and that's relationships and connections with each other. Legacy has, uh, I think, one of the best um, culture of support and relationship of any program that I've been associated with. And so what we added to those four things was a fifth thing, which is healthy relationships. That's um, right. It was already there, it just wasn't, it wasn't uh, actually in the written model. So we got that in there too. As a I appreciate that, Maddie. Um, <laughs> it's okay. 
<laughs> nostalgia, I think about, I remember as we sequestered ourselves into this room that we had gotten from a local community member and we spent days working on this. And I do think that having a heart at peace really lends itself to the relationship component, but it wasn't, it wasn't intentionally labeled. And that's something I really value in what you added to it was the intention mm -hmm. of relationship. So last week, we started talking about the anatomy of peace, and I wanted to just do a quick overview to review from last week the way of being. Every behavior can be done in one of two ways, and it's what's behind what we do or what we say that's much more important than actually what we do or what we say. We all intuitively know where people's intentions are coming from, and we will mirror most often what we are receiving and the two ways are having a heart at peace or a heart at war and when we have a heart at peace we objectify others and that objectification usually is because of one of three things the first we see the other as a problem or an obstacle or we see them as a tool or vehicle to be used to get what we want or three they're neither of those, and so they become irrelevant to us. And at any time that we treat others in any of those three ways, we have a heart at war. Now, versus having a heart at peace, where the other person is as important or as real to me as myself, my own, my, their own thoughts, desires, and pains are as important as my own now i still doesn't mean i will necessarily um have to give in or placate or um, withhold or get to these patterns of trying to avoid the other person because we're equal doesn't mean i'm a less than position but i put as much credence on their experience as i do my own. so th this this happens all the time with people that we interact with the most, we're making these decisions about having a heart at war or heart at peace, like split all the time, split a split decision all the time. And uh, doing that chronically, especially if we're in a dynamic where it is a heart at war, to conserve energy. And because it takes a lot of, whenever we do this, having a heart at war with someone, there has to follow a justification because it's not a natural state for us. And so we'd start to justify why we did this to conserve the energy. So we have to go through that justification all the time. We develop what the Arbinger group calls boxes. Um, you know, more from a cognitive behavioral um, type of, uh, of psychology, they call them schemas. But it's a belief system a way that we have adopted without even even knowing or acknowledging it. This is our belief system. So that we don't have to jump into justifying every time we have a heart at war. And the most common ones that we do is being better than. And I think most people who have the better than box, like 80% or more, is often because they're protecting themselves from feeling inferior or less than. But this is what they put out to everyone else. It's their belief system, which is that I'm important. You know, it's a win-lose often type of schema that they're superior, often virtuous, and they have a view of the world of everything being competitive and maybe other people just always being a problem. I know growing up in, a, um, in, uh, in an educational place where things were pretty competitive, Think that this was part of the schema that I was given and adopted of always being critical and uh, looking at everything through a lens of being critical. And therefore, you're always looking for the mistakes. Your view of other is what's wrong. And then always feeling like maybe a little bit concerned, disdained, impatient. And then the opposite of that, because like a lot of people cope with that, but a lot of other people cope with being in the worst end box. So just as often as we see, I need to be a little bit haughty 
maybe I need to be the one that's always being harmed. I'm the one that always has to pay the consequence of this for everyone else. I imagine most of us as parents feel that for our kids, that we pay the consequence for our kids more than they do. And they mentioned that most of our kids want us to provide for them teenage retirement. <laughs> Maybe that's something I do for myself. I can see myself saying, why am I doing all the things? Well, there's cleaning, um, keeping the house, work. But that becomes part of the worldview, is that things are difficult. Life is hard. Maybe life is unfair. And then, I think, begin protectively, not just protectively, maybe better than worse than more protective, but then to assert ourselves, to get our needs met, we often find ourselves in the must be seen as box or the I deserve box. Yeah. For example, if I, need, if, I, if I have had unmet needs most of my life, then I can really be um, feeling like I've been taken, on grant, taken granted for, things are ungrateful, I feel marginalized, like things are unfair. Okay. And so it can create feelings of entitlement and, um, I view myself as being underappreciated. And then the last one is the must be seen as box. That I uh, I want to be seen a specific way because and then I want to control the narrative. That is so for and this is also somewhat protective that the more I can control the narrative, the uh, the safer I feel. Um, because my view of others of others is that they're threatening, that they're judgmental. The world is dangerous that they're watching i become hypersensitive often in this and so like a lot of people who are in the must be seen as either in a negative or positive way cannot they're not comfortable if people aren't sharing their point of view and so if another point of view is presented they do everything they can to extinguish that or put a uh, to close it shut a door on it and try to alter that way that that person is thinking or feeling. And it's usually because they, 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 it threatens their sense of safety. And so they're trying to get back to that sense of safety as quick as they can. And that can only come when you see the world as I want you to see it. So those are the four boxes. And, and I think Maddie mentioned this last week that there's probably more than just four boxes. You know, if we think of schemas, we all end up developing schemas that we have created to help us navigate this hard world that we're in and particularly when we have a uh, son daughter ourselves in treatment and um, how we uh, view the reasons why we're in treatment we can create a lot of schemas to help us cope all right so um so what happens is that when we are living in those boxes and we are you know operating from a heart at war we tend to get into these dialogues with each other and this is a this is the anatomy of peace uh, version of the same thing we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, the negative cycle that two people get into. And um, the, the parts that, that you can see is starting on number one down there on the bottom is that someone will do something. So there's some kind of behavior that's submitted. And then and there you go. Thank you. Good, good <laughs> marker. And then the other person will see some things and they'll kind of interpret what that person did so they'll see the behavior and then they'll interpret it in their mind about what does that mean and then they'll do something number three in response to that behavior and then the other person will see something as a result of that behavior <clears throat> and make a, a conjecture about it and make some dec decisions about what that means in the relationship um, so, for example, and this you can see some of these things are um, badgering or complaining and insisting that they do as I say um, is maybe one of the ways that this starts with the parent doing it that way. And then number two is that they see that I'm an object and my parents are demanding or unreasonable and they're nagging me. And so then I, number three, protest. Maybe I comply, but I do it with an attitude. Um, I do whatever I can to let them know, you know, what, that I'm not happy with the situation. And then they um, see, again, an object instead of seeing a person who's self-centered and considerate, immature, and not, you know, growing up the way that I want, want him to grow up. And then what happens is that 
when we get into this negative collusive cycle and we start going around and around, we have a tendency to want to get people on our side. So we'll talk to our partner or we'll talk to our friend or we'll talk to somebody else and say, can you believe that he did this? Uh, I can't believe it. And they'll say, oh, yeah, that's really dumb. And then they become our allies and we start, you know, kind of getting sides. Since the same, and the kid does the same thing. Maybe he says, um, can you believe my parents are so demanding? They're hovering. They won't give me any space. They won't let me grow up. And so then he gets allies over here too. And maybe even people in the same family, like maybe they get a, a parent, the other parent becomes an ally to the, to, the, to the son or daughter. And so then you end up basically with two warring groups of people. This is why we go to war. And almost every war that you can <laughs> historically look at has started in this kind of a way and has ended up with people being uh, this uh, separate from each other and seeing each other as objects and not seeing the other person's point of view at all. So I'm going to give you an example from, um, well, I'll just give you an example from, from my life and what I end up doing a lot of times with my husband. He's a really nice guy, um, but he is a terrible driver. I mean, he's just scary driving. And he sees everyone on the highway as an object, and it's an object to get around or to get past or get you know uh, over the top of, I feel like sometimes. And so what happens is he drives like a crazy man. That's number one for me. So he, he's driving you fast. He's slamming around. You're getting, you know, all of, thrown around the car. It's terrible. Uh, and so what I see when he does that is that he's inconsiderate. He's not thinking about the rest of us. He's putting us in danger. You know, we're going to all die. And, and I, I just get really frustrated. So what I do is number three is that I start saying, slow down. What are you doing? You're driving me crazy. You, you know, this is a crazy way to drive, stop this, whatever. And what he sees is I don't trust him. And I don't think he's, you know, being, you know, taking care of us or he's not doing a very good job or, you know, that basically that I don't trust him. We've almost gotten to the point in our relationship that a lot of times I do a lot of the driving just because we just get into this cycle so quickly and so easily every single time. And it gets, it gets just, it just gets us going and going and going. And for me, it was, it's like, um, I keep thinking I should do better than this. I should, I can see this happening. I can see this cycle happening. And I, one of the things that was consoling to me about this is that I was in a training with Mike Marchant. Is that his first name? The guy that has Anasazi toy? Yeah, that's right. I said, and he, he was doing a training, uh, an anatomy of peace, peace training with a whole bunch of people. And he's, you know, part of the group that wrote some of this stuff and, and he's been doing the trainings for a long period of time. And what was encouraging to me about this is that uh, he's doing this training and in the, the, he gave an example of the collusion diagram that he got into with his wife over the dishes that very morning. And, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I, you know, maybe I'm not so horrible because I keep getting into this cycle because it's so easy to fall into the cycle. The difference is, is that when you see yourself in the cycle, you get to choose to do something different. And especially before you start getting allies and start turning it into, into a full, full uh, blown war. And so the, just like we were talking about before in our, um, in our other trainings is that identifying the cycle is the first and probably most important step in stepping out of it. And as you can see, the main way of stepping out of it is once you see it is recognizing the other person as a person and not as an object, because being, seeing people as objects is why we stay in this cycle all the way around. And feeling like we're an object uh, is, is, is how that cycle keeps getting perpetrated. So I'm just going to ask you to think about, um, can you see this collusion cycle? Can you think of an example of this collusion, collusion cycle in your own life? And maybe even just in the last 24 hours or the last week. Uh, and for sure, can you see it? in working with your son or daughter. Because we do get into this uh, insisting and badgering and they feel like they're being nagged. And so number one is us being um, pursuers. And number two is them being withdrawers. And in, in both cases, we're not seeing each other as people or feeling like we're being seen as people. Um, so think about that. Maybe we can ask a question like that and, and, and have you respond in your mind to, about that. Um, but part of one of the things that you talked about in some of our feedback that we received this week is um, how to stop these conversations from going south. 
how to not let it turn into one of these negative collusive cycles, how to rebuild trust, um, and even dealing with our personal guilt as parents. A lot of times as parents, when we can see that our sons or daughters are struggling so much, it's a natural thing for us to take responsibility for that and to think that it, you know something that you know we've done wrong and, and, it's, and it's our fault that things aren't going the way they're supposed to go. And then unfortunately, sometimes what we end up doing is um, we feel guilty about that. We feel guilty about our not being able to be as good of parents as we want to be. And we start trying to make up the difference and what that looks like becomes enabling. Um, like giving them money more than they need, um, giving them uh, you know, opportunities and um, things that maybe they need to earn themselves. Um, and, and it turns into, then that leads to the entitlement. And like Troy said, that uh, d development of that feeling of, uh, I deserve for you to take care of me in this way. I deserve um, to have a new car because I got good grades or, you know, or whatever it is. And you end up with this, uh, um, I think you call it a teenage retirement that they feel like they don't have to do anything. <clears throat> And that you're doing all the you're doing all the making up for it, but sometimes that comes out of feelings of guilt and feeling like you're not being able to um, parent as well as you want to. So we're going to spend some time and relate a lot of this to parenting today. And so, um, what I just wanted to say to add to that too, Maddie, that um, when we're in the boxes, I think we we need the collusion diagram because that's part of the unaware justification that happens, where we almost need to see them in a certain way so we can justify us being in the box towards them. Mm -hmm. And they need to see us, like they need us to be an authoritarian parent, for example, so that they can justify why they're rebelling. And that does lead to that justification and, and continues the war, keeps the war going. And so part of what, what, we're, what, we're, what the process that we're really trying to do is, it's growing adults. <laughs> Um, like growing a garden, we're growing adults, and um, it's a tough it's a tough job in our culture these days. Um, but the process is called individuation. It's the process of a of a child coming into the world completely dependent on their parents. They need they need help even lifting their head, and you're 100 percent taking care of them. And the end goal is to have them be independent, where they can operate as an adult, be a responsible citizen, have their own families, and you know continue that process. But what happens a lot of times, it's not a direct line from dependency to independence. It's a tough, it's a tough go to try to get from point A to point B. And sometimes things get really skewed. And what we end up with with our children is that they're counterdependent. And so what they are, when they get into counterdependent places, they think they're being independent. But what they're doing is just doing the opposite of what you want them to do in order to feel independent. And it's they're still completely controlled by by the parent in that they're doing the opposite of what the parent wants. And that becomes even, even more frustrating. So this model um, that we have up on the screen right now called change parenting is one way to think about the process of parenting. And the pollution cycle, the negative cycle we get into, that's all the communication process and developing those attachments and relationships. This is kind of a over, overarching uh, model to kind of see why these pieces are so important. And as you can see on the on the axes, the going up up and down is having healthy boundaries, being clear about what those boundaries are. And then the bottom uh, is having strong relationships. And so what happens is is you get help, you know, healthy boundaries on this side and strong relationships on this side, then you can get to the being in the zone, which is the true parent up on the top right hand corner. But if you're not quite there yet, if you have uh, maybe too many, uh, you're a little bit too high on the authoritarian side, or you have too much boundaries and not enough relationship, I guess is the best way to say it. So high boundaries, low relationship, then you're seen as an authoritarian. And that might, you might be trying to force compliance, um, but you don't but uh, does not tr uh, win the trust, respect, or belief to motivate the durable change. And that incites rebellion uh, whenever they possibly can. So that seems to be the result of the child. If you're not doing either one, if you don't have clear boundaries and you don't have relationship, you're basically an absent parent. And, every, and the child is in crisis all the time. Like by failing to build either healthy boundaries or 
relationships, um, then you you have neither the will nor the skill for your um, for your child to grow. And then uh, if you have strong relationships but no boundaries, then you're more of a friend than a parent. You're more concerned with pleasing than with training. It subvert, you subvert the rules and structure and discipline necessary to develop life skills uh, and that appeasing enabling and even becomes codependent in unhealthy, in unhealthy behaviors. Um, and so you see on the, on the two axes, it talks about healthy boundaries, which gives our children the skill to change and strong relationships give them the will to change. And so I'm doing this on uh, the uh, stages of change idea starting with pre-contemplation, not thinking you have to change anything to contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And you notice that the curve is a little bit towards stronger boundaries than it is towards stronger relationships at the beginning. Uh, and that's because you, you, if you're gonna err, you know, err a little bit more on the boundaries. Think about little kids. You, you know, you can't go through the gate, you'll run out in the road, you'll get killed. You know, so I'm gonna be a little bit stronger on the boundaries, but at the same time building relationships. And that's why the, the the arrow kind of curves a little bit more of that direction as it goes toward true parenting. And then the true parenting, it inspires and empowers others to see and realize their awesome potential. And they respond with safety and respect. So that's just one way to kind of visualize that process of, of creating a safe place for your children to grow into adults. Um, when Maddie presented this to me, I thought of a study that that I reviewed when I was back in college that made a lot of sense and I continue to see how we fall into it today. And it takes what Maddie shared and and you know, we're all relational. And so we fall into these dynamics with each other. So it's not just about what we as a parent or as parents are doing that fit those four quadrants, but that we as parents may be in the same quadrant and we may not. And so this study uh, looked at a self-report of mostly adolescents, older adolescents, saying what type of parenting style led to adolescents reporting that they would accept their parents' influence the most. And those kids said, my parents who have a high level of nurturing, moderate but non-negotiable boundaries, and they spend time helping me think about the future of my of my decisions that this parent right here had the most influence but what the study also found is that a lot of times parents we will polarize with each other especially during times of crisis for our children and that when our children are when they get caught uh, cheating stealing uh, using substances that one parent will respond to that by maybe increasing or putting a renewed emphasis on their nurturing, but they become afraid of confronting the child, as you talked about, maybe the friend instead of the parent. And so they drop on their boundaries. So I think we're probably, this is a fluid state, these, these quadrants, it's not a static state, but this parent also is sometimes afraid to help the kid explore what the future might look like. So they both have low exploring the future, low boundaries, but a lot of emphasis on nurturing. And what a lot of the, in this situation, a lot of times the other parent uh, will take a polarizing view. It's sort of like if you imagine both of you in a rowboat, and one of you starts leaning out and you're afraid you're gonna tip over. So the other person starts leaning out the other side. And now both of you are like leaning way out of the rowboat, being angry at the other person for almost capsizing this boat. So what happens is, is that the other parent drops their nurturing. So they're way down here, but they put most of their effort into, let's have strong, rigid boundaries. That's what's needed right now. And they put a lot of time and effort into trying to help them see what they're doing wrong. And so the kid will often hear that more as lecturing. And so we have these divided parenting styles that will look like this and look like this. And when we're split like that, we find that the kid can walk through our parenting style often with more authority than we do. 
and we have almost no or little influence on them. But when we can try to not polarize, pull back into the rowboat, and together find a way of doing nurturing, deciding what our non-negotiable rules need to be, and spending enough time looking at the future of the consequences. That helps us realign and reestablish proper influence for our children.